when it comes to um, family stories or family history <laughs> in novels, I realized that I, although I spent a lot of time in my childhood and my youth reading family sagas that were based on genealogical trees, that I quite developed an, uh, a sort of allergic reaction <laughs> to the idea of a tree as a grounding metaphor uh, for a family. It just didn't make sense anymore when I had to apply it to my own family in the sense that it establishes a certain hierarchies, you know, bigger branches, smaller branches. And if you think in matriarchal terms, it seems that there is a great great mother and then another mother, and then you descend from this line of women. But as a daughter, I knew <laughs> almost as a fact of blood that I could be the mother of my own mother sometimes. And this is what really happened. So I felt like all of these branches were shifting all the time and I was interested in exploring the, these shifts and uh, I felt that it was more relevant in describing a family to adopt new metaphors and since the story of my family is so intertwined with migration there was another form or grounding metaphor that I wanted a little bit to get rid of and it's that of roots that is so connected to trees because when we talk about displacement, identity, and belonging, that feels like almost the automatic image that comes in your mind. Have you put roots in this soil? You haven't done that. Where are your roots? And to me, it's a pretty violent image because you can, you know, take roots out of the ground. You know, there are so many acts that can decide that this new species or person or plant doesn't belong here and it's a really deep form of eradication. So I felt that to me it was more instinctual to talk about belonging and family in terms of spores like particles that move within the air or belong to constellations in a way. Uh, so rather than branches I was thinking also about light in a way. So a mother doesn't shine <laughs> with the same intensity throughout the course of a lifetime. Sometimes she gets shut down forever. Sometimes she reappears. I think this is true for any kind of relationship we hold in life, but especially the primary ones. So I felt it was really interesting in terms of a narrative sequence or like telling a story that you would think about characters as recursive light or light that disappears in a way it breaks the idea that if you have one interesting character you have to follow it till the very end when we learn about time <laughs> as kids uh, we are exposed to this idea that something happened after something else. And of course, there's something objective in this. It's the grounding base of history lessons. But at one point, while growing up, you do sense that this is not always the case. I don't mean to be Nietzschean uh, at all, but I was raised in this part of southern Italy that was exactly in the middle between uh, where writer and painter Carlo Levi wrote Christ to stop the Deboli. Um, and so that book tells about his confinement during the fascist years in this community of people. He fictionalizes it a bit, but it's uh, really close to the work of anthropologist and philosopher Ernesto de Martino. So it kind of establishes an idea of timeless South made of archetypes, stereotypes, and myths. And so I felt time was still. On the other hand, I, uh, there was this engineer and poet called Leonardo Sinisgalli that instead was working on anticipating time. He was very close to the uh, post-war economical boom. He was a writer of that sent writers to factories. He had magazines about uh, civilizations and techni technology. And so at one point I realized I was really literally <laughs> growing up in between these two different ideas of uh, myths and time and how magic evolves. And then with La Straniera and Strangers I Know, I was trying to come up with my own idea of how time worked and affected the experience of my parents, for example. And that felt interesting into applying it to the idea of deafness or some kinds of disability itself. In the book, I say that my father was anticipating the girls he was dating in time, that he is his being deaf was not so much a disability, but like a glitch in a time span because we'll all end up being differently abled somehow 
my hearing is maybe because I listen to <laughs> so much noise, uh, noisy music is not what it used to be. And it's interesting to me to see that this kind of disability is quite the invisible majority in a way because we all are related to someone who has um, different abilities. And it's so interesting to see how we categorize them according to time. So if you're a deaf um, young man or a deaf young woman, your uh, your visibility your disability stands out in a different way compared that if you turned into a deaf person in your old age and nobody would even consider you deaf, they would just consider you an old person. So to me, it was interesting to see this intersection point in time or the idea of what we have of a uh, normal <laughs> or a normalized body. Strangers I Know for me was an act of reclaiming uh, all the broken languages I held within myself. And as I was writing the book, I found out that there were many of them that I had repressed. And the relationship with language, of course, is um, immediately shaped by parents or adults that teach you how to, how to speak. But then there is an important part in my case, since I was a child of migration, that was represented by public school. So in a way, the Italian that was taught to me had many reverberations in a way that it was implied that in order to become uh, a good citizen, a good person, I had to really master the language in all of its properties. So I became kind of a soldier of <laughs> written and spoken Italian. And my speech and my writing was, of course, deeply influenced by the English that I lost, that it was, you know, my lost mother tongue because I moved to Southern Italy from Brooklyn when I was six years old. So I was supposed to learn English in school, but then I had this kind of uh, accidental or reversed migration from the future to the past uh, in a way. So my learning Italian was really um, about erasing or eliminating all the background noise that came from my very polyphonic family because I learned to speak and the first idea of sound of, of speech in my life came from two deaf parents but also a family of migrants in Brooklyn uh, my grandmother and my grandfather were not highly educated, so they spoke dialect. They didn't even know Italian. When they moved to the States, the dialect turns into a sort of very fragmented, broken slang in a way. And also it was interesting to see how they could use their unlearning the language as a strategy to blend in uh, the, the kind of society. And they were inventing new words in a way. So my first words were made up words. I, I remember that um, in Italian, you bag, you say busta. And in English, you say bag. And when I moved to Italy, I started saying uh, bega or bagsa, something that didn't exist, but made completely sense for me and my mother. So I kind of felt a sort of longing for all of that lost lexicon that I had to give up to. And then it became really interesting in stylistical form, like uh, formally. And I, I think my language is more uh, rich right now because it's reclaiming all the wrong uh, lexicons that I had built within themselves and at one point it had to leave behind in a way. When the book uh, they started, Elizabeth Harris started translating Strangers I Know into English, I had to re realize that I was very involved in the process but from a very distant perspective in the sense that I don't write in English. It doesn't do much for me. It does a lot in terms of nonfiction or writing analytical stuff. I think it kind of carries, delivers my uh, essay stick writing in a better way but it's not the language of novels for me. And if I think about it, I like writing in Italian because of the tenses. The idea of time has a wider scale. You can go into more futures, into more past. It's more complicated as a layered structure compared to English. And also the tenses in Italian, like in French, can be highly irregular. So it feels there are always exceptions to, to, to the rules. And if I really have to think about it, so I love the Italian sound and I like the variety of language, but it really has to do with the tenses. And so going back to the English, I had this imposter syndrome. I felt that 
moving to southern Italy and losing that language was highly traumatic for me. So although I speak it, I still see that girl that should have gone to school there, should have been educated there, maybe would never have become a writer. But there's always, to me, migration is the history of all of these holograms you left in certain places. And somehow they still have a life and they still, you carry around them with you. But it meant for me to like face this other version of me like from a very close perspective. And I was immensely grateful that a, there was a translator do, there doing it for me and acting as a sort of mirror in between. So I would not have to face the original and lost language of the of this book. I call the English in Strangers, I know the blueprint language, like I built up on it. Uh, and maybe I created different buildings and roads, but it, underneath you can still detect that there was a different sort of map in that language. When I think on how deafness affected my idea of language, there are many ideas that come up. But one is a similarity that um, children of deaf adult often have with children of migration. So kids that moved into a new country with their parents and they are in school, so they acquire the language, but the parents still don't speak it. And so they are very young interpreters and being an interpreter has many consequences because often you have to deal with bureaucratic language, language of social workers, the language of health healthcare system. And then I realized that my Italian was from the very start an adult Italian in a way. So it was um, very f fast, I think, losing all of the uh, naive element to a language, the playfulness, perhaps the silliness. And it was really mature in a way. It was a sort of advanced state because I had to be the interpreter for my parents. So in a way, I think that the longing I was talking about before, I feel it that it's also relevant to writers that come from bilingual or trilingual families and have experienced migration in a very early age and then they learn the official language and then the practice the art of writing becomes like unveiling all of that and trying to reclaim that sort of silliness and like ma making up things say that I was talking about so I think that's one point where deafness uh, uh, affected the, my vocabulary uh, let's say I was like mastering and also I was skipping school a lot and as I say in the book I was reading books that were really not meant for my age so in a way I think it could sound really funny to adults because I would you know speak like a uh, like, like a novel uh, in a way and it was also interesting because often in deaf readers or speakers, there is a resistance to allegorical language, metaphorical language, symbolical language, which is key when you write. And so how was it possible that I was going to be like so influenced by all the uh, kind of particles that are around words in rhetorical speech or figures, whereas my mother couldn't uh, have access to that. She was not interested in that. That to me was also uh, important. Her resistance to the idea that uh, words are not what they are meant to be in a way, that we use words not to deliver information and not to carry meaning. Uh, I think as a child, uh, when I, you learn to speak, you also learn certain words that are related to the world of, let's say, feelings or affection. So I was exposed to a mother that didn't care so much to teach me the words amore or like love or happiness, felicita, but she would teach me two words specifically, one, and there was almost obsessive uh, freedom and meaning. So the word meaning really literally had a strong meaning in my household. And so that's also what affected my writing and my perception of language. Do we use words to really convey meaning? Or sometimes when you have this beautiful, ornate, very lyrical and Baroque Italian writing, it's just to show that you know the technique. And I think as a writer, this is a really challenging and important question to when you think what you really want to do with, with the written form. As a young reader, I would never come across um, deaf characters in fiction or novels or even in film that would resemble my parents. And it's not necessary to 
you know, approach art looking for answer for your own personal reasons. But I was really interested in kind of uh, realizing how non-abled bodies and deafness was represented. And I felt it always had to carry something monstrous about it, something exceptional about it, and something that had to stand out, not only because of the deafness or the um, being different abled, but you had to, to, in order to be visible, you had to do something extraordinary. And in my case, my, my parents, uh, I mean, were in the borderline and bipolar spectrum. So there was a lot of also mental illness going there. There were different marginalities clashing together. But if I isolated the deafness in itself, I realized that they were frustrated from a very young age to the idea that they had to have this hypersexualized body. They had to have this hyper theatrical body. My mother was in um, very good at acting in school. She would get the best part in place. And at one point she quit. My father uh, was, I think, street casted oftentimes because of his looks. And then he would become very nervous because they didn't use sign language, but in a way acting felt that they had to, you know, be very present with their gestures and their body. So it had a very odd a uh, feeling or a sense that it would make their deafness even more visible. So I was really interested in the um, being performative about your own uh, diversity. And then when you think about it, we are exhausted by the debate on identities. It's been, I mean, uh, almost two decades that it's been so central in cultural theory and fiction and the way we represent uh, reality, but it was interesting to me to see that we were ready, you know, to unpack the way that class, gender, uh, religion, or ethnicity would affect you coming into being or growing up or living in the world. But it felt like disability or that kind of diversity was always in a why it didn't belong to the idea, and uh, why are we so scared by reclaiming? The, that kind of diversity which belongs, if not to our own bodies, but often to someone very close to us or someone who's going to become differently abled quite soon, if not ourselves. So to me, uh, I think things are changing. But when I started writing La Straniera and Strangers I Know, I felt I was still living in a world that if you had academic conferences on disability, the only people who would go there were or either disabled people or someone in a relationship with someone disabled or a daughter of a deaf uh, adult, like in my case. I think this is shifting interesting and it's very important, if not for ethical or moral or political reasons, it's really important in terms of the excitement you can get out of characters and fiction. There's nothing more boring in a way when you're sketching a character than following all the stereotypes and expectations that you have about it. So deafness in novels was often uh, grotesque, in a way excessive, and uh, always had to be, uh, as I said, performative in many ways. It felt reducted only to, to body talk. At the same way, like blindness would often be uh, related to visionary powers or uh, I really, really loved the, the piano uh, by uh, um, Jane Campion and when I was a, a little girl and the mother was not deaf. She didn't have, you know, she had aphasia. She, she wouldn't speak. But then the fact of not speaking would always be related to women, uh, usually pretty women and usually women who would be graceful in, in a way. So I was even jealous of stereotypes around other forms of disability because I felt that my mother's deafness was so loud in a way. And so I, I, I was kind of trying to exchange, can I have like a mute mother compared to, to a deaf mother? But that, of course, was the imagination of a child. And and I think that now I pay way more attention in general through the spectrum of differently abled bodies. I really am more sensitive in the way we sketch, imagine and build character uh, on a page. And so to me, that's important, as I said, not only for political or ethical and moral reasons, if you don't want to think about in terms of literature, it is really important in terms of variety or interest in, in even entertainment and fiction. I think of literature through something I learned while writing um, 
strangers I know, and it seems that this is comes from very far, <laughs> but it's the horoscope. Uh, I used to hate horoscopes. I, I've had a deep refusal of anything esoteric and magic because I was growing up in a family with m many marginalities. And to me, I was very moralistic and it, before becoming a Marxist in a way and thinking that you had to solve material problems through a material attitude. And so magic had nothing to do with, with that. But the horoscope ended up being very interesting uh, in what we look for when uh, we are looking for clues about ourselves. And this is true whether you're reading about your astrological sign or you're reading an academia in a way. So when you read the horoscope, that's a text that is meant to be the most generic as possible. It has to speak to anyone. Uh, and so it has to be vague enough in order to tell something. But then you have this hunger, this strive for it, that it will really affect and change your day in a way. Even if you don't believe it, it kind of messes a little bit up with the idea of what's happening to you in that moment. So something really, really genetic, generic becomes highly individualized and highly personal. Uh, when I think of auto biographical <laughs> narratives or memoirs, uh, when I think of that, it seems sometimes that it comes from the opposite position, if it's good uh, work in the first person, that it moves from this very individualized story or something that happened to you, unfortunately, often revolving around the idea of trauma um, or like a rupture in, a, in the course of a life or grief, but moving from something that is very specific to the person who's telling the story in order to reach a wider audience and then become the most generic as possible in a way, the most universal as possible. So I think that what was playing in the background of my mind, I was really worried that when you tried to tell a story that has multiple marginalities, like uh, you're describing a working class environment with affected by mental illness, migration. It almost felt like a joke, you know, <laughs> in a way, all the possible marginalities were like synthesized in the life of my mother and then of her children. I was really worried that it would reproduce a state, a sort of like bell jar around me, uh, like reinforce the idea of isolation. And I beautifully found out that through words and through uh, this deep belief in what literature can do, it kind of shattered this sort of bell jar. And this very specific story of a woman became, in a way, uh, although it seems that I'm boisterous about it, but it became quite universal. And so you could use a life as a device, in a way, like a convey to hold within something that is happening very far away from the life of that woman. So that's what I wanted to do. And I think, I believe literature is universal in the moment where it moves, even from very tiny dots <laughs> in the cosmos, very specific lives, maybe even marginalized lives, but it has always this strive to move beyond that single dot or that single story. And so, and this can happen to me in narratives in third person or first person. I, I don't believe, I think it's lazy criticism thinking that only because you're using the I, you're necessarily the most, at your most intimate writing with yourself. I belong to a family of romantic imposters, but also hoarders. That's true. That was true for my grandmother. It's true for my parents. This idea that you can accumulate objects that perhaps would be useful one day or maybe never. In a way, it really places a lot of faith in mat the materiality of, of things, which I found annoying, but it has its own you know, po poetic value, I guess. And I am not my parents' daughter in like real life. I feel I am their daughter in the way I write books. I accumulate materials. I hoard. <laughs> and I think that you can pile up materials even if they're useless or unnecessary in a way. There's something beautiful in this idea of something that is non-functional and you still have it around you because maybe then you change perspective about it and it still has a second, third or fourth life. Um, so it's quite ironic that we come from years and when 
in which we think about recycling a lot, giving a second life to things, uh, not discarding objects. And But then when it comes to editing and novels, there's this idea, this is useless, we just have to get rid of it, whereas digression <laughs> was fundamental, uh, even in the Greek epics. And so when I was accumulating materials for, for the book, I realized that I was defying the idea that there is one story and one book within one book. I often uh, pitch or write synopsises for my future projects or books I'm currently working on. And the first comment I get, feedback I get, this is five books, this is six books, give me the book. And I uh, will ever do that <laughs> in a way because the book is the result of walking, not in circles, but trying to find your way out of the maze. And when you look at all the path that you've done, it's quite sad to think that it's, you know, one uh you hit it the first time. In a way, if you write a book, you have to be really willing to commit the idea of wasting materials, losing time, and losing yourself within it. Or at least that's the kind of book I aspire to write and I like to, to read. I was really impressed when I read Aliens and Anorexia by Chris Krauss. I think it was in my years of college, it was translated into Italian. and. It was interesting to see how you could patchwork the life of a woman through other very distant women like Simone Weil or Ulrike Meinhof, and you can blend in in a sort of seamless way this factuality or other biographies into and built a sort of critically theoretical but also poetical like frame around the life of the narrator. And the second question that came out of that book when I read it was, who's allowed to do this? Who can afford it? And who deserves it? And this is also a question that Chris Krauss kind of unveils in their work. But I was really um, almost provocative in the idea that also my mother, even though uh, she doesn't read critical theory <laughs> in a way, but she embodies it in many senses, in many ways. And uh, she deserved essayistic like strive in the book she deserved to have her youth uh and her uh, uh, very <laughs> badly shaped relationship with men uh with their sexuality to be you know counterposed or have this juxtapositions with the theory of whales uh, the whale falls or uh suzanne simmer's idea of you know the, the, the roots like mushroom uh, speaking to each other and uh, like trees that conspirate with each other in order to protect themselves from a fire. I was really interested in this idea that something that we think belongs to only to very sophisticated uh, literary nonfiction or hybrid nonfiction could belong also to these marginalized characters or the underclass in a language that was not... Um, that was very to take the challenge of being also plain in a way. Uh, in the Italian version, the book, the, I was often asked why I didn't opt for an avant-garde style. I wanted the book to be accessible. I wanted my mom to be able to read the book. That was really important uh, to me. And when I think of Anir No's approach, when she gets this question about uh, being plain, she says something that is also related to defending these working class roots or small bourgeoisie roots that she was raised in post-war France. Uh, and she says, I'm not gonna uh, like climb up into language in order to satisfy expectations of what literary fiction is. But at the same time, I'm not gonna give them too much color in a way because a uh, reader, some sort of readers some readership really claims when it comes to working class narratives to colorful language and slangy or being misshapen or being uh, quite vulgar or crass sometimes so i found her position in terms of style not being too flowery and not being too colorful interesting because again when we look for meaning and we try to find the best form to convey a language we are also thinking constantly to this feedback uh, thing that plays out in our mind when we're writing. Um, and then I, I think to me, this 
I wanted to to use this very sophisticated theoretical form, but convey it through very simple language. I think I was trying to make a, a point <laughs> with that, that not necessarily something stratified and complex and that constantly unpacks stereotypes has to be done so with difficult or obscure language that's often bad writing and that's it. As an Italian American author, I often got the questions, oh, we have great Italian American men authors, we are the women. And so that started me on a sort of personal quest. And I found out that they were not only in kitchens, <laughs> often they were working or unionizing or organizing work in factories. And the reason why I answer through the perspective of Italian women of migration is because I think there was a sort of smartness that came with dealing of luck of political uh, presence in a way, especially women from the South, that brought up in fiction when they started writing. I'm thinking of Ana Maria Mortese, I'm thinking of Elsa Morante, you can think of Elena Ferrante, Fabrizia Ramondino, Alice Ceresa was a, an avant-garde translator, um, Swiss Italian. But all of these women had this sort of rage in a way that came from lack of visibility and infrastructure that was kind of replaced with a, a flood, not only of words that are stylistically important, but they were really conveying uh, ideas of parallel models of modernity in a way. And so I often found the work specifically of Italian women or Italian displaced women, women writers in the diaspora, that they withhold this kind of beauty and rage all, all the time. So to me, that's the main contribution to the history of literature in a larger sense. The story of a family is more like a map than a novel. In an autobiography is a summation of all the geological ages you've passed through. Writing yourself means remembering that you were born with rage, that you were thick, steady, flowing lava, before your crust hardened and cracked and allowed some sort of love to emerge, or that useless power of forgiveness came and smoothed you over, leveling out all of your hollows. Rereading yourself means inventing that you've gone through, identifying each later you're built upon. The crystals of joy or loneliness beneath, the result of some evaporated memory, everything that's been carved out, then flooded, only for you to realize that time's not healing after all. There is a breach that can be filled. The only thing thing time will do is carry dust and weeds along with it until that crevice is covered over and transformed to a different landscape, distant, almost a fairy tale, where you no longer realize the language spoken that I might as well be elvish. You cross the ruins of your family and realize that some words have been erased while others have been saved. Some have disappeared while others will always be a part of your reverberation until finally you arrive at the edge of your father and your mother after years of believing that dying or going mad was the only way to live up to them. And then you realize that everything in your blood is becoming and you're just the echo of a past mythology. <laughs>